Welcome everybody, Lehigh, <laughs> Lehigh Valley Health Network Carbon Hospital. Is it great or what? How many people have been here as a patient or visitor? Raise your hand. Is this unbelievable in Lehigh? It's awesome. Thanks for coming. So I was asked to talk today about same day knee replacement surgery, but that's not what I do. I do rapid recovery outpatient total knee resurfacing. And so I'm going to explain the difference to you. Okay, so that's what we're here for. Today I actually did five of these this morning, ages 55 to 83. They're all home already. They were home by one o'clock. Amazing. I've been doing this 30 some years and the evolution has been unbelievable. So a lot of these questions, you know, I answer every day in the office. So before I get started, Lehigh Valley makes me say that <clears throat> this is only for education. This is not medical advice. If you have your own doctors, that's where you get medical advice. This is just for education. And plus it covers them because they never know what I'm going to say. So they don't take any responsibility for anything I'm going to say today. So this is a disclaimer that sort of that the disavows them, if you were. So what I thought I would do is just put this list of bullet points that people ask all the time. I could have a whole day symposium on this, but we're going to talk about anything knee related, anything that you want to ask. We're going to talk about what's the difference between outpatient and same day knee surgery? How do we select people? Who's a good patient for this? What's preoperative preparation? What are the advancements that allow us to do this? What are the alternatives to surgery? What's our multimodal pain management that allows us to do some sort of big knee operation this morning on people 55 to 83 and have them home eating lunch today? What's the role of robots that you might hear about? What's the need for rehab? Where do you do it? What's that all about? How about the implants? How have that changed? Nutraceuticals. Any question about Lehigh Valley Health Network Carbon Campus, the risks, misinformation, dogma out there? kneeling questions, sutures, revision, recovery, any of that. So why do I call it resurfacing and not replacement? And it's because it is resurfacing and not replacement. If you have your hip replaced, who has a hip replacement in the room? Ha, huh. your hip is replaced. You took out the ball and the socket and you have a whole new joint in there. Shoulder replacement, anybody have a shoulder replacement in the room? Oh, you got a brand new shoulder in there. But what, when we do a knee replacement, we don't really cut out the knee and put a new one in. It's almost like a revelation. Patients go, oh my God, I thought that's what you did. But it's really not what we do. Historically, 30 years ago, we did take more structures out. We took more bone out. We took more ligaments out. The prostheses were larger, thicker. They had stems or rods that went up and down. So it was a more for experience years ago, but now it's more accurately considered a resurfacing, almost like a dentist. He doesn't pull the tooth, he resurfaces it. And a lot of our components are like dental implants in that they grow right into the bone where they're not cemented in anymore, which was a big reason for failure historically when the grout would loosen. Just like my Cuzo, my patient over here, who put a lot of tile in over the years. And Mike's grout never loosened, okay? Mike's grout never loosened. But if you did, you could get a loose tile. And that was the biggest reason for knee failures. One of the top two reasons that knees failed is it wasn't really high on the list that they wore out, but it was aseptic loosening where the cement would loosen or you'd have some catastrophic event of a fracture or an infection. But the question people ask, <clears throat> How long do they last? And, and we could go over that. 
But anyway, this is what a worn out knee looks like. Think of, think of arthritis as wear on the end of the bone, a chicken drumstick, a turkey drumstick that articular cartilage wears. And so that's all we need to replace. You didn't tear your ligaments, you didn't destroy the bone. So basically this, this is an example of, of what we do. And um, on the picture there, it looks like a crown that we're putting right on the end of the bone. And that's exactly what we're doing these days and actually can grow right onto the bone. And people say, oh, that's a partial knee replacement. Let's have a pie go well. That's where the terminology gets a little confusing. This is a partial knee replacement if only a part of your knee or half of your knee is worn out. So only less than 5% of patients will have the inside, the outside, or the knee compartment. So that's why it's called tricompartment arthritis in a knee. There's three different compartments. And so that gives you a good idea of what a partial knee replacement is. It's just one compartment. Only 5% of the patients are amenable to this. And this is why I call it a resurfacing like a crown on a tooth. So I think that's sort of a good explanation that answers half of the questions when people come in the audience. And here's an x-ray of the difference between um, one of our modern outpatient total knee resurfacings on the far left, and then this is a partial. So you see it looks just like a crown on half of it. But again, and the best patient for that is on an x-ray where only part of the knee is worn out, but they also come in with what I call the one finger sign, the index finger. And they say, this part of my knee is sore, just one part. But when they come in with the grab sign and they grab their whole knee and they say the whole thing hurts, then you're pretty much not a candidate for a partial knee. How do I know if I need a knee replacement? And the way I answer that question in the office is really 50 years ago, there were no knee replacements. The human race did very good without us. So for whatever you think, 50,000 to 200,000 years, whatever the argument is, when Homo sapiens ruled the earth, there were no knee replacements. So you don't really need one. It's a quality of life issue. But now we live longer and we have better technology to give you that quality of life. So it becomes a very individual decision about when to have that. Um, I've done them in 22 year olds and I've done them in 95 year olds. So a lot of people come in a second or third opinion and they say, I'm, I'm here because I need something. My doctor told me I'm too young for a knee replacement. More misinformation. One of my pet peeves in medicine is misinformation. There's a lot of it out there. And that's one of the biggest ones. There's just different risks at different ages. And a lot of times a 50 year old guy will come in, hardworking guy, his knee is worn out, previous sports injury, meniscectomy, multiple procedures. And he says, I'm too young for a, new, a knee replacement. Um, I'm miserable, kind of miserable. I can't go to work. I'm taking anti-inflammatories. You know, but I have to wait 10 more years. And I say, this is crazy. Why would you have to? Well, the doctor said that I have to wait till I'm 60. There's no arbitrary age. This is all nonsense. This is wrong. There's just different risks at different ages. The more active you are, the younger you are, it is more likely that you may need another operation later in your life, but it's not predictable. A lot of these components are now in computer simulators for 20 to 30 years, simulating 20 to 30 years of wear. And it's not the metal that wear. It used to be the polyethylene or the plastic, which is basically nylon. And the first generation of nylon 20 and 30 years ago was, was not perfected. And now they have it machined such that it's cross-linked and they put vitamins in it. They put vitamin E in it. Vitamin E is actually one of the anti-aging vitamins that anti-aging clinics give to patients. And why is that? Because it prevents cross-linking in your skin. And that's one of the things that causes wrinkles as we get old. So if we could use it to stop cross-linking and aging in our skin, we can actually put it in the plastic and the polyethylene, which stops oxidation. And so it doesn't 
age like the old ones do. So that's one of the things that allow these knee replacements to last decades. This is our knee. And so this is the evolution of knee wear. So, you know, when you have a brand new knee when you're a teenager, well, it can go through stages of wear and then it becomes worn. And then at this stage, there's no other option. But between this stage and this stage, there's a host of conservative treatment before you're at the end stage that needs a partial or a whole knee resurfacing. And so, you know, most people are familiar with the, that list of conservative management. But as you go down the threshold, when your knee starts, you know, aching after a sports event, when you're younger, you have some over-the-counter anti-inflammatories. And a lot, of, a lot of those are, um, a lot of people come in and say, oh, they don't work. There's so much dogma in medicine. I take an Advil or two or it doesn't work. And I say, well, the reason you could buy it is because you didn't go to medical school and you don't have to prescribe it because they've diluted the doses so low that it's not like the old prescription doses. Before it went over the counter, the average prescription dose was six or 800 milligrams of ibuprofen in a pill. So now you need four of those to equal 800 and the prescription dose was three a day, three 800 so that's 2400 milligrams, that's 12 Advil. People go, oh my gosh, 12 Advil. So, but that used to be the prescription dose that was good for advanced arthritis. And now we know how these medications work. You can add Tylenol to them, which a lot of pharmaceutical companies do, and that works by a different mechanism. And so if you combine two different types of medicine, like an anti-inflammatory and an analgesic, it works for a longer period of time. So even after the knee replacements today, most of our patients will go home on an anti-inflammatory and Tylenol as their major pain medicine and not a narcotic, but they have to do the met prescription doses. So, but even for a bad knee day, people will say, I'm going away skiing, I'm going on a trip to Italy, I'm doing some hiking up in the vineyards, I said, well, take some Advil or leave. But the math is completely different and you sort of have to understand that. But you have a bad knee day and you take 800 milligrams of Advil and 1,000 of Tylenol, your knee will feel great. And you can take it three times a day. That used to be the prescription dose. I'm not saying to do that, but people need to be educated and then they could take their own dosages. So that's a whole you know, different animal when, when you can <clears throat> you know, treat yourself. So that's, you know, that's for mild arthritis. It can start at two, four, six, 800 milligrams. And you can take it up to three times a day. So you have a whole range of conservative treatment. There's no free lunch. You take it enough, excess anti-inflammatories can hurt your gut lining. They can hurt your kidneys. Excess of Tylenol can hurt your liver. So you sort of have to understand that. So most people that go from here to here that need a new tire at some point will go through the anti-inflammatories. They'll go to the different injections that are out there, and we could talk about those, but two major categories are steroids and some of the hyaluronic acid injections. Physical therapy can be a double-edged sword. Some therapy is very good. Some therapy can make you worse. So people, depending on how severe their arthritis is. There's exercises that are very good and gentle in a swimming pool, on a bike, walking, etc. And there's some that are bad. Lunges, running, hiking with weight on your back, etc. So you sort of have to understand where that fits in. Will physical therapy help me? Physical therapy is not one item. It's not one modality. It's like a whole bunch of different things. Lifestyle modifications, you know, there's a big difference if you're an accountant sitting at a desk all day or you're Mike Cuso putting in tile on three floors all day carrying weight up and down the stairs. So if you could, you know, if Mike could automatically go from being a tile layer to being an accountant, maybe he wouldn't need a knee replacement in the next year. 
Lifestyle modifications. Weight loss is a big one. Weight doesn't necessarily cause it, but it can accelerate it. There's very few patients, 40 to 60, that we do that aren't over their ideal weight. So weight, whether you're carrying tile up the stairs all day or you're carrying it around your waist is you know, a lifestyle issue. So as it gets worse, um, you know, there are people that say, I don't, you know, I don't want surgery, what can I use? And there's some people that say, I don't wanna use a cane, I'm embarrassed. There's other people that say, I'll do anything to avoid surgery. So that's an individual decision. So you can unload the weight on your legs using walkers, canes, and that's what they did 50 years ago. And then they used a wheelchair, you know, and that's an individual choice, but that's what happens as we progress down the line here. There are braces out there, some work, some don't, some are expensive, some are over the counter, but a lot of braces are unpredictable. They're like shoes, they're like shoes. You don't know if they're gonna work till you try them on. And so a lot of these things are expensive. You know, they cost a thousand dollars and you buy them. And you know, it's like orthotics, you know, in your shoes, you pay $300 and they don't feel good. So there's a lot of risk to the braces. So um, neoprene sleeves, just simple pull on sleeves are often helpful. 50% of patients will say they feel better. They provide some compression. It's like, it's like wrapping an ace bandage on it provides proprioception around the knee. So those are things that people try. You know, they'll try all kinds of things. Some have science to them and some don't. A lot of the funny taping you see all over patients' knees, you know, some work, some placebo, some doesn't. And uh, again, the weight loss. But so there's a huge progression. Some people will be at this point and they have a lot of pain and they say, I want my knee done. But some people, it's amazing. They come down to this point and they'll get it done. But, you know, x-rays, x-rays, um, as we saw on the x-ray up there, you can, you know, there's another misnomer of bone on bone. My doctor says I don't need a knee replacement because it's not bone on bone. And see, x-rays were invented 100 years ago. And they're not much better than they were invented 100 years ago. But they're still a good starting point. They're a great starting point. But your knee is always worse than the x-ray. So that's the take home point. So you get an x-ray, you can have a normal looking x-ray and still need a knee replacement. So that's a good indication of the, uh, the knee on the, on the far end there. That x-ray might look normal because, you know, he has holes here, the whole knee is not scraped off. So that's a good indication. This is what that knee looked like when he was 18. It's just beautiful, pristine, articular cartilage. And again, that's a chicken leg that you may have looked at or a turkey leg. So that shiny stuff on the end of the chicken bone, I try not to look at that um, when I'm eating dinner because it <laughs> just reminds me of what I did all day. So I really... So this is what we do arthroscopically. So it's pretty cool. The far, the far right picture is what a normal knee looks like, um, very close up. The end of the femur bone, there's a meniscus um, between the femur and the tibia and a cartilage in the middle. And I always say to patients, that looks like a cue ball or a hard boiled egg. So that's what normal cartilage looks like. Here's a great picture of another knee under the kneecap where his x-ray may look normal but they go, you know what? My knee sounds like Velcro when I walk up and down the stairs. What's that noise? And I said, does it hurt? They go, no. I said, well, I don't really care. Knees will make a lot of noise for many years before they wear out. If the noise hurts, then it tells us that you're getting more exposed <coughs> bone. So again, this cartilage has worn off under the knee. It's pink, that's bone. This is normal cartilage, but that's what makes that noise going up and down stairs. Here's what I call the evolution of total knee replacement. When I graduated medical school in 83 up until now, and I trained in Philly at Jefferson, the Rothman Institute, and we were in the hospital for a minimum of seven days. Everybody had general anesthesia. Then you went to rehab for anywhere from seven to 21 days. No pain medicine until you woke up and you were screaming in the recovery room. Then they gave them narcotics and then they had a, a morphine pump where you press the button 
And then that got everybody sick, so they were throwing up. And then they couldn't pee because they had urinary retention. So then they'd put a urinary catheter in them. And then they would go up to the floor and they had the drains that they put in the knee because they had big incisions. They weren't minimally invasive procedures. They would bleed. They would need blood transfusions. Um, they lost a lot of uh, bone. They had epidurals in their back and they were itchy. And then they, they went down this downward spiral. But that's what we did. And it wasn't our problem. Once we got done operating, they went up to the floor and that was the nurse's problem. How, how did we get to the point where we can actually do what we did today where there was no hospital stay. They don't go to inpatient rehab. We have rehab in different modalities now. You can do it as an outpatient. You can do it online. There's, you, we teach the patient a lot of times. They can do it at home. Half of our patients take no narcotic pain pills. When I go to new hospitals or there's a new anesthesiologist, I tell them, I don't want my patient getting a narcotic. And the anesthesia, I, to, I had to learn anesthesia. They said, well, what do you mean? I said, we don't need it. But this is what they did. When people say, I can't tolerate anesthesia, I get sick to my stomach, I go, cross out anesthesia and write narcotics down. So we can do anesthesia without narcotics. And the best anesthesia, we don't use general anesthesia 95% of the time. People go, you don't, you don't use general anesthesia? I go, no. We don't have a tube down your throat. You're not on a ventilator. You're, you're sedated. But as long as you, you don't have a contraindication, we use a very short-acting spinal. So we use a spinal, which is the safest anesthesia to have. And the reason, even if you have general anesthesia, you're asleep, but as soon as we do something in the OR, we make an incision on your knee, you're not awake, but your body feels that. And the reason we know that is your heart rate goes up, your blood pressure goes up. And so how does the anesthesiologist treat that? Well, he gives you narcotics up there. So you're asleep, but that's what they do. If you do spinal, you basically numb the spinal cord. So when we make an incision, the pain signal stops at the spinal cord. The brain never knows it. And so the blood pressure doesn't go up, your heart rate doesn't go up, your body doesn't know that it was stressed. So why did it take us so long to figure that out? So we could do the whole spinal. I say no, no narcotics in the spinal. In the recovery room, um, we almost never give narcotics. Um, we have it there for breakthrough, but we almost never need it because we start our pain medicine the day before surgery. We give so many things before surgery, but they're non-narcotic, anti-inflammatories. We give Tylenol, Celebrex, steroids. We give a lot of that stuff. Smaller incisions, not much bone removed. Supplements. We didn't learn about supplements in medical school. So unless you took it upon yourself to educate yourself, many supplements are anti-inflammatory. And they help with healing and decrease infection. So we have a whole a set of nutraceuticals that we give to patients. All of this is educational. So I call it de-escalation of surgery. I've learned many things from the cancer world. I love to look at the breast surgeons. They've de-escalated surgery. So I stole that word. And by that I mean they do little lumpectomies. They do targeted radiation. They do sentinel node biopsies. You don't see radical mastectomies. Um, chemotherapy is very, very selective. Only if you have a genetic type of breast cancer that's amenable to that. So I look at that and, you know, they sort of pat themselves on the back and say how wonderful it is. Now we've de-escalated it. But I look historically and, and just think of, of how traumatic it was historically. Well, knee surgery is no better. Just I just showed you that slide, what we we used to do to people, this big operation, throw them in the recovery room, and so give them narcotics. And narcotics are responsible for 60% of the complications. So what we, you know, what we do today is not terribly different than what we did 30 years ago. The prostheses are somewhat better, but I could put them up here from 30 years ago. And you, know, you can identify them as sort of a knee component. But yet the people are home in two hours versus a week. And so we've, de we've sort of thought every step through.
And, you know, opioids were the gold standard by all other treatments that were measured. But they caused allergies, arrhythmias, mental health issues, constipation, dry mouth, nausea, vomiting, ileus, intracranial pressures, neurotoxicity, itching. They stopped your breathing, urinary retention, withdrawal. So, you know, historically that was responsible. 60% of all our post-op complications can be due to opioids. So the driving force for us to figure out how to get away from narcotics was a couple things. The opioid crisis, which we all know of. So our average patient takes three to five pills for the whole recovery period. That's average, and half of them take none. So outpatient arthroplasty, we can't send them home unless we figured out the pain. We sent them to the recovery room and it wasn't our problem. Let the nurses deal with it. We sent them home. It's our problem and the family's problem. They don't like that. So we've figured that out. Um, and Medicare approved outpatient total needs five years ago. So that these were sort of the driving forces.